Thank you so much for coming to the Building Forward Better, Catalyzing Investments for NCDs. I would now like to pass the floor to Dr. Carrie Adams. Dr. Carrie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, as you heard, my name is Carrie Adams and I'm the CEO of UACC, but importantly, I, I sit on the board of the NCD Alliance and have been involved in some time. Um, I also have the privilege of being the treasurer of the NCD Alliance and uh, given my financial background, I'm very interested in the subject of today's discussion, which is to make available, hopefully, uh, more funds or investment in the issue of NCDs globally. We're just going through a pandemic, which has highlighted a number of key challenges uh, for uh, general population, for governments around the world, who we have been cajoling for many years to invest in NCDs and the addressing risk factors. And uh, what we have seen in the last 20 months has been a massive increase in the awareness of investment in health to avoid major problems in the future. And the billions, trillions that have been invested in addressing COVID may be a, an opportunity for the future approach to NCDs, or it may actually be a problem for the NCD community. Over the last 10 years or so, we've not seen the amount of development assistance dramatically grow for NCDs, despite the case, despite the UN high level meetings, despite the investment case being made by many organizations and the great work done by the NCD Alliance and the World Health Organization and many of the other organizations who are on this webinar. Now, I'm sure that we're gonna talk about the problem. And I think the problem has been well rehearsed over many years. The problem has compounded the challenge that we've had for COVID. And it's also given us an opportunity, hopefully, to talk to governments about the long-term investment in health infrastructure in universal health coverage to protect individuals from NCDs in the future, reduce the level of unnecessary deaths. So we have an opportunity as well as a challenge. At that point, I'll hand over to Doug Webb. Uh, Doug will be facilitating and moderating this discussion. I'm sure that we'll have a lot of great ideas. And it's a challenge for all of our community to take those ideas forward and ensure the advocacy supports the case to argue why we should be investing in NCDs globally in a world which is dominated by COVID challenges at the moment, but will continue to be challenged by NCDs post COVID. Doug, I'll hand over to you and the best of luck. Thank you, Carrie. I hope you can uh, hear me and uh, see me. Um, the best of luck, I'm sure, is because these conversations are always a lot of fun, as they should be. Um, there's a lot of ideas that we will be thrown around. Morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. My name is Doug Webb. I'm uh, in the HIV and Health uh, Development Practice in the UN Development Programme here in New York. And thanks to the NCDA for inviting me to take us through the conversation um, today, which will hopefully be stimulating and interactive. We've got seven speakers today um, across uh, two panels, and you'll all be uh, as well uh, out there invited to participate. We'll have uh, a question and answer session after the, the panelists have, have, have spoken. So listen in and think about what's being said, and you can put your questions in the Q&A uh, box, and the panelists will be invited to uh, respond when you send your questions in and also we'll have question Q&A uh, at the end. The, so the, the, the panels are going to look at two sort of fairly big questions around the NCD um, financing arena right now. The investment for COVID, um, the investments for NCDs in the COVID sort of era or the, sort of the COVID times, um, and the extension of that in the uh, recovery and the pandemic preparedness and response. Uh, COVID has, has highlighted the importance of, of NCDs and chronic conditions, underlying conditions, as they sometimes called in, in infectious disease speak. So, you know, it's galvanized a renewed interest perhaps um, in NCDs as they relate to infectious disease disease progression and severity. And this idea of tipping patients over the edge and tipping health systems over the edge. So 
you know, should the NCD community be sort of really making more noise about um, a tackling NCDs prevention and treatment management um, in the context of COVID, but also pathogens of infect, you know, emerging infectious disease, emerging um, in the you know, unknowns, disease of virus X perhaps. In, in the context of pandemic preparedness and response, where a lot of the, the big money is being pushed. And that raises the question, which we'll look at in the second panel, of this idea of integration of NCDs more generally across global health goals, programs, and, and other major financing mechanisms. We have talk of multi-donor trust funds under the World Bank. We've got multi-partner trust funds under the UN, UNDP, UNICEF, WHO. We've got integration of NCDs into universal health coverage. The new global AIDS strategy talks about HIV. There's this long conversation, uh, talks about NCDs. There's this long conversation about integration of NCDs into the work of the Global Fund and comorbidities because have we reached the stage where financing in NCDs in and of themselves hasn't worked or isn't successful? Have we kind of given up, even though NCDs are the largest cause of morbidity and mortality in and of themselves on the planet? This is a bizarre situation that we are talking about integration and looking at, at NCD financing within the context of other financing mechanisms as the mechanism financing when actually it is of itself the largest cause of morbidity and mortality. Why is NCD financing so repellent? That is perhaps the question. Why is it still less than 2% of overseas development assistance for health? So the panelists will pass that question they'll tease it and they will answer it with a plomb and data and specificities and leave us all in no doubt at the end of the conversation what we have to do next starting with our keynote speaker dr anders nordstrom who's the global health ambassador the ministry of foreign affairs from sweden and you know, I maybe asked the question at the beginning. Where is the you know the G7, the G20, um, in in looking at financing for low middle income countries? Most of the money that we've seen of the largest recipient of money so far for NCDs has been non-governmental organisations. Where is the exchange of technical uh, support, the money going to? Um, governments of the South um, and the building of public capacities in the public sector of the South. So, Anders, how do we get policymakers to prioritize non pandemic health issues, NCDs going forward in the mid uh, to long term? Anders, you're very welcome. Well, thank you, Doug, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, delighted to be with you uh, and for this uh, seminar today. Um, I'm, uh, Sweden is not part of the G7, neither the G20. Um, but we have had the privilege of being associated with the G20 as we've been chairing the IMF Council now for the last year, my Minister of Finance. But I would also like to use a little bit of my experience and knowledge from having been the head of the Secretariat of the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response during the last year and some of the insights. Uh, but to answer your question, how do we get policymakers to prioritize non-pandemic health issues? Let me provide three reflections or advice on that. The first one um, comes from having listening to the leaders in Glasgow. Uh, we might be disappointed that we're not making more progress on the climate agenda. It's a crisis, we are living it. Um, but having listened to the leaders, I thought this was quite different this time. We would have liked, as I said, to have seen and heard more, but still, hearing the prime minister from Belgium saying this is serious, hearing or seeing that countries are now making commitments to stop cutting down our trees, the deforestation, hearing that the leaders are now making a commitment to admission on methane gases. These are actually concrete political um, 
commitments. I would say in a slightly different way than what we have heard before. The question is how can we get the same leaders to speak about health? But the question before that, um, I heard also some people asking about Glasgow and saying, will this materialize this time? Uh, and one of the comments was that possibly a better chance because this time is linked to finance. So there is a commitment now for glo global climate financing, uh, but also specifically if you speak about the deforestation to be able to compensate countries in the South um, that will need not to cut down the trees, but still to be able to survive. So money matters. And here, at least what people were reflecting was that Glasgow, and you were saying uh, tipping the patients, but I would say this was a tipping point in some way um, to make the climate agenda, the green agenda real. So um, advice to us working on health and, and then specifically NCDs is that this is about hard work. If we look back to what has happened, what did it take us to get to Glasgow? Mobilizing people, mobilizing science, mobilizing politicians, a lot of hard work. This was not done overnight. So I think first sort of conclusion to the message, hard work, let us not give up. But let me also come to some of um, how to do this to be smart. But let me before that, just provide a couple of perspectives from the work we did from the independent panel why we made an analysis of what has happened what is happening right now um, in this crisis that we are just uh, living and seeing this is of course not just a crisis of, of a virus the solution is not just about getting a vaccine there this is this the close this close shown us that we are living in extreme um sort of vulnerability lack of resilience in society. Um, people that are the most vulnerable have been the ones suffering the most. So, I mean, what we have seen, what we have seen is not just the society that can't manage the virus, but who can't, that can't man manage people's health needs, and more importantly, can't manage the crisis. So I think moving forward on the health agenda, we need to continue to make people actually to see what we are, what we are living right now. The reality of today and Again, if you go back to G7 and G20, uh, I think some of us were disappointed uh, that even if people are realizing and hopefully seeing what is happening right now, they are not taking the right kind of decisions. And of course, part of what we did from the independent panel was also to look at the, at the cost. Uh, and of course, the cost to be able to deal with this pandemic has been enormous. What it would cost to stop it is just a very small fraction of that. What it would cost to prevent is even less. The problem here, and that's I'm going to come to that at the end now, about NCDs and the, also the need to invest in preparedness and prevention, is that Minister of Finance, the development banks, key financing institutions are much less keen to invest in the long-term pre preparedness. It's easier for some stupid reasons to pay when it happens, to pay the high cost when we are in the crisis, instead of investing in the long-term preparedness. So that's a little bit of the background. Um, hard work, lessons to be learned, leverage, benefit from that we are still in a crisis to position health, not just pandemic uh, and the virus and not just NCD. So being a bit provocative at this seminar, I mean, I'm not sure that we should stick to the NCD agenda. I mean, we need to move to talk about health. We need to speak about how we can prevent and, and enabling people to stay healthy. We need to ensure that we get an integrated health services. We need to ensure that we get the right financing for health. And this also what we need to take into account, Douglas, you said only one to 2% of ODA. Global health today and the financing of health, we need to stop focusing on ODA solemnly. I think that is st still should now be a historical moment. Where we see what is happening is, of course, that the economies in low and in middle income countries are growing, the domestic investments are increasing, the relative importance of ODA is decreasing. So we need also, if we're going to be smart and if you're serious about really wanting to do something about the burden of NCDs, the premature mortality relating to NCDs, which is the biggest burden of disease today, especially for poor people, it's no longer, the solution is no longer only going to be about ODA. ODA is still important, but not the only solution. So more moving forward here, possibly leaving 
the distinction in between NCDs and community diseases and think about how do we equip people to be able to make more healthy choices? How do we work on enabling people to avoid risks, equipping people um, with the right kind of resources, knowledge, but also right kind of values and culture that will promote more healthy behaviors. But also, of course, practically at the health service level, how do we ensure that services available at the primary level, that we have the necessary drugs, the insulins or whatever we need, but that needs to be part of a comprehensive UHD package. Uh, so I think there's a lot to be done uh, to use the present momentum, show what we will miss otherwise. Uh, I'm not so sure myself um, that to stay in isolation or try to stay in isolation making the NCD case is the best. I think what we need to put up front are facts. The largest burden of disease is actually addressing people because of NCDs, yes. But it's the, the diseases we should speak about and how those then can be prevented and what we need to invest now in terms of prevention, but also integrated service uh, for people if they are affected by, disease, by the, the diseases. I stopped there and hope this was a bit useful and happy to come back in the discussion later on. Thank you so much. And there's many thanks. Um, you, you're spot on about domestic financing, point well taken. Um, one follow-up question very quick. I will abuse my position as chair. The G20 Health and Financing Board uh, Task Force, as it's now called, should the NCD community be looking at that and, and really gathering itself to uh, influence how that conversation will be taken forward in the, in the reviews that it'll be doing? I think it's unavoidable that we need to strengthen the international system to deal with threats in, in some way in its own right. Um, I, my, my main sort of political sort of what I'm seeing right now, there's a movement to put certain things in place. There's still a lot of different views from the G7, the G20 in terms of how and what should be done. Uh, I'm not sure that that's the best place to put the, the efforts right now on that task force. Uh, I mean, one could, when you speak about surveillance, how do you ensure working on people's behaviors, that you make the case that there is a win-win situation here when it comes to how those resources are used so that they're not used in isolation only for, for out outbreaks of um, sort of diseases with pandemic potential. But um, I, I think, I mean, if one should, I, I mean, many of us were disappointed on the G20, was not more concrete. On the same time, there was a paragraph about uh, both the importance of working on the, on the NCG agenda uh, um, about universal health coverage. I mean, there are other entry points um, um, I think there's still a lot of question mark where that task force will go. Um, I think the, let's see, I think that's an interesting um, dilemma for us all is to where to place our uh, attention on if we're going to integrate and um, find alliances, where those alliances are going to be in the next 6, 12, 18 months. Thanks, Anders. Um, stimulating as always. Uh, let's go to the first panel. Um, we're going to talk more about the uh, NCD financing in the, in the context of, of pandemic and then ultimately pandemic preparedness and response. Um, we're going to uh, first welcome uh, Bente Mikkelsen, who, as we know, is the director of the NCD department at WHO. Um, deeply ensconced in all these questions, Bente, all the time. Um, We've done a lot of work around these questions of making the economic case, making the fiscal arguments, um, demonstrating the returns, looking at the perpetual losses that are being uh, borne by societies, uh, looking at the devastating impacts that COVID's had on NCD service deliveries. Are these arguments making any difference to investments that are being then catalyzed? Bente, over to you, welcome. Thanks a lot. And um, you will see that I have a long slide deck, which I will not speak to because I sent the wrong one. So I'm, I think it's a kind of a human thing. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you, Anders and, and Douglas, Terry, all of you. And I will answer the question. So if you could go to the first slide, I will give you some uh, context that you know from before and some new. So if you could show the first slide, please. And the next one. 
And the next one, thank you. Um, so, and jump one back. So I think one of the things that are really important is that we all speak in very big letters. So I think the global um, health estimates that came out in 2019 is extremely important for us. So seven out of 10 diseases that cause global uh, deaths is NCDs. Seven out of 10, the two main uh, diseases is linked to hypertension. Next slide, please. So what we know is that even before COVID, it was a very dramatic uh, development for NCD, and this is NCD and other diseases, as you see. Next slide, please. And now I will also show you the, uh, of course, the slide that is for me the most important one, that uh, is the lack of integration of NCD into universal health coverage, which is really one of the explanations why we are so little prepared, in my view, for this pandemic, but also for the next one. So you see that many other diseases and conditions are actually integrated more during the years than NCD. Next slide, please. Um, and we know already that we have a, uh, we had some progress the first 10 years uh, of the NCD agenda and it dwindled. And this despite, of course, all the three high level meetings, the UHC, meeting, also now the HIV, UNGA um, uh, resolution that includes NCD. Next slide, please. So I want to show you, um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, sorry about this. Um, and next slide, please. The latest survey that we did on, um, uh, on COVID and disruption. So this was 100% uh, uh, of the member states uh, answering a survey since uh, between June and October. And as you can see, still during this, uh, um, this part of COVID, two years into the COVID situation, you have huge disruptions for all the major diseases, all the major NCDs. And I think we need to really look at that picture. And then I will challenge ourselves because the question now, with all the money going through the Global Fund, the World Bank, uh, also to some extent, uh, uh, UNITAID and other uh, financing uh, mechanisms, where are we uh, as NCD? If you look at the language used, um, as you said, Douglas, it is a little bit about underlying conditions. But I think we need to name them. These are people uh, suffering uh, from the onset, from cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diabetes, and lung diseases. And they are not getting the healthcare, not before and not during, and especially not during COVID. So we should be core to the preparedness agenda. We should be core to the PHC and health system strengthening agenda. Even if we look at uh, uh, prevention, it is the same answer. So the question is, where is all the inclusion of NCD into the proposals coming into the Global Fund, to the World Bank at this moment, as we speak? And when I have inquired, it's not science, but when I have inquired, there is almost nothing. So I think before we really focus on financing, we have to ask ourselves, are we able to express demand? And if we are not able to express demand, why are we not able to express demand? And it comes down to really small details, but it's not details, of course. And that is the lack of capacity to actually develop these proposals. The proposals is very much developed through the same old, I would say, global architecture as we have seen for years. So it is the people who has been traditionally working with HIV, uh, AIDS, malaria, and TB that are also now developing proposals that goes uh, together with COVID. So I think this is something we need to try to be much better at. Next slide, please. And I think some of the answers on how we can build, build a new interest for the NCD agenda is to look into the mitigation strategies that we have seen now during COVID. And I think the focus on community is, is key. The focus on digital is key. The focus on new uh, ways of uh, uh, providing access to medicines. It's also key to continue to look into the huge in influence of uh, uh, tobacco producers and alcohol producers. When we just went through six regional uh, uh, expert um, consultations to develop the implementation roadmap, 
we had uh, three very, very big asks from all the experts, all the regions. So one of them was, please help us with data. Please help us to be uh, utilizing the data existing, but also to develop more data. Second was, please help us to uh, focus on access to medicines. Please help us to also, the third one was to help us to uh, empower and to get workforce on ground. I see your uh, very nice picture on my screen. So I will just jump now to existing financing solutions and answer your question. So if you uh, move to some of the next slides. So one of your question, thank stop. And uh, one of the questions you asked me, Douglas, uh, was also one of, the, one of the conclusions or recommendations from the evaluation done for the NCD Global Action Plan. So the number one is find financing uh, mechanisms. This is actually the first recommendation to the World Health Assembly, which is also the basis for the implementation roadmap. I would like to say that in the last two years, we have been able to, um, to um, uh, mobilize 20 million US dollars uh, just from my department in a WHO. So it is some hope uh, and some understanding for, from some of the development agencies. And of course, having one country like Norway having NCD uh, development strategy approved helps. But we are far, far away, of course, from what we need. So the next slide, please. And I think you know better than, um, than me, and you will hopefully comment on this yourself as well, Douglas. But I used this picture of uh, my boss, Dr. Ren, where he says something about uh, financing and he's mentioning uh, uh, the strong effect from ECOSOC and also uh, that we need to start to capitalize on the WHO, UNDP, UNICEF, multi-party trust fund uh, on NCD and mental health. So of course, this is one of the solutions and I, I'm sure we will hear, hear from the World Bank. Uh, next slide, please, on their sort of uh, starting point of an NCD also uh, donor trust fund, which is also excellent. And my last slide is, next slide, um, also new mechanisms that we are putting in place, which I think can be a way to go. And it's really in harmony with what Anders says. I think we need to be more granular. We need to speak about tobacco. We need to speak about alcohol, but we also need to speak about cancer. We even need to speak about uh, global childhood cancer. And I think the reason why we are able to mobilize funds to actually uh, create a platform for access to medicines for childhood cancer is because it's understandable. It speaks to the heart. It is also granular, very specific things that needs to be done. primary health care uh, systems and, and included into UHC. I think that was my last slide. Maybe you can click once more. Yes, sorry about that. So the last slide is, uh, and this is probably not known to everybody, at WHO we do several things. We have a global investment case. This one was from 2017. We are just about to launch a new one. The UN Interagency Task Force do very important work with uh, investment cases at global level. But we see also the need to do more specific investment cases. So uh, we are doing this for cancer. We are doing this now for diabetes and it will be part of also the update of the appendix three as some of you knows as the best buys which will come as part of the implementation roadmap i will stop there because now you you look very um happy thank you back to you douglas i always i always try and look happy benta yes and I, uh... you succeed yes i think so thank you very much for that um uh, thank you, Venter. Yeah, I mean the the the, the, the case is, I think the case is convincing on on you know the economics of investment in this area. I think the the challenge is 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 obviously the financing of the the flow of investment to where it's needed, and as you said, uh, uh, getting the the articulation of the demand from the right places, i.e., the public sector and LMICs, and uh, uh, putting them framing them in in the right way to the right financing mechanisms at the right time in the public sector in the governance mechanisms where uh, overcoming the 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 impediments 
to that proposition. And I think this is what we've found very often is that there are policy incoherences, there's oppositional forces, be it in legislation or commercial determinants, or it's simply the lack of attention or support to that uh, proposal or proposition process in a, a context of competition, other, other priorities, or simply not having the evidence or the data available, and as, as Anders was alluding to, not being tenacious enough, perhaps, when other financing flows are pre-established. So I, I think that it, it's it's just a case of of, of being uh, persistent and and cracking on, and that's what the um, the multi partner trust fund is is really all about. And domestic financing increase is one of the de de you know, determined outcomes of of that. It, but that is a governance response. Uh, you've got to have that conversation. So thank you, Bente. Stick around because there'll be more questions on that. Um, moving on. Um, uh, Tom, are you there? Welcome, to Tom Boyke, who's director of the Global Health Program and senior fellow at the Council of Foreign uh, Relations. And you've spent a lot of your time looking at the interactions of underlying conditions, NCDs, chronic diseases, call them what we will, and and nasty pathogens. And you have made a very compelling case that these things are linked and should be paid more attention to. And I, you know, if you could sort of convince us again of this and I think also point us sort of strategically perhaps to what we do with this connection when we're trying to um, you know, finance the, this. What do we do with this information I think perhaps is, is, is the question. Tom, you're very welcome. Great. Well, thank you so much um, to the organizers for having me here. It's always an honor to appear with uh, many of these speakers on this important topic. So it's it's nice to see everyone here and have a chance to engage with all of you. I've been asked to speak about some work we've put out around the links between uh, non-communicable diseases and what we, uh, the experience we've had in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I don't have slides, so you'll have to listen to me. Um, but, uh, or look at me as I, I go through this talk, but I have uh, just put the link on the chat where you can see that interactive that lays out all the evidence that I'm going to be talking about here. So I, I invite you to, to look at that. Um, so the, the links between uh, NCDs and COVID-19 are really in, in two areas. Um, the first is just simply that, um, it shouldn't need to be said, but policymakers seem to forget it, that COVID, uh, the, the existence of the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, does not stop the toll of other diseases. Um, NCDs has long been the world's source, largest leading source of premature uh, death and disability, including in low and middle income countries. Uh, that remains the case even during the pandemic. So NCDs still represent the top three leading causes of death, despite the devastating toll of COVID-19 uh, worldwide. That's not going away. Uh, the second area, and this is really the focus of that interactive that I just put into the chat, is uh, NCDs or COVID-19 has exposed a unhealthy feedback loop that exists between non-communicable diseases and outbreaks of emerging infections. And here's how that works. Um, step one, and I'll go through all three steps. Uh, NCDs have made COVID-19 worse. Uh, the high prevalence of obesity, diabetes, other non-communicable diseases has been a major contributor of the outsized death tolls from COVID-19, particularly in uh, the United States, Europe, and Latin America. To draw that out a bit further, and you can see this again in that interactive, higher burdens from non-communicable diseases uh, are associated with higher death rates per capita from COVID-19. Uh, that trend is, or that connection is even stronger when you look at specific NCDs like obesity. That is not actually true for the overall health burden of countries. So when you add in infectious diseases or injuries, the connection goes away. This is important because there are actually very relatively few things that we can point to other than um, 
uh, in addition, also looking at age, that are statistically tied with the difference between differences between how countries have done in this pandemic. We've looked at universal health coverage, uh, different pandemic preparedness metrics like the joint external evaluation or the global health security index. And there is no relation between how countries rank on those metrics and how they have done in this pandemic. But this very strong relation exists on NCDs. And nevertheless, we are seeing financing for future global health security target many of the things that have not been proven to make a difference in this particular pandemic. All right, here's step two of that feedback loop. Uh, COVID-19 in turn has also made NCDs worse. It has done this in um, several ways. Uh, it's drawn the need to respond to the devastation from this pandemic, including in the economic uh, sphere, has shifted international aid and domestic health spending away from NCDs and, and health systems. As Doug mentioned before, um, funding for NCDs has always been low as a um, share of overall development assistance for health. Uh, it has fallen further as a share of overall development of systems for health in this pandemic. So it was less than 2% before, it has declined 25% relative to overall health spending since this pandemic began. Uh, simultaneously, uh, NCDs, I mean, or the pandemic has interrupted uh, the provision of prevention and related services globally, and that's having consequences and worsening uh, the toll of NCDs. Third and last step in this, in this loop, uh, NCDs are making other, pan will worse uh, toll from NCDs will make other pandemic threats as well. Uh, there's extensive research showing that NCDs, obesity, and smoking use or tobacco use prevalence in particular are linked to more severe outcomes from influenza and Zika and, and so forth. So the last case, I, I, what I would sum up just in, in two sentences here is that the legacy of underinvestment in NCDs has worsened uh, what has happened in the COVID-19 pandemic. That story does not need to continue for future pandemics. This singular focus on COVID-19 and global health security uh, cannot come at the exclusion of integrating NCD and NCD-related services into the way that we think about uh, health overall, but particularly pandemics in the future. And let me stop there. Thank you, Tom. I think the, um, the the challenge we have is how to persuade the financing structures of this. Um, it may well be true. Um, it's 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 making the point, um, and I, I I don't know how we can do that. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's the conversations I've been involved in. Um, uh, it's so co at the moment so COVID focused that there's there's well, there's an argument in the middle of the COVID conversation and there's a lot of noise around the edges of it. Everybody's trying to get in at the edge, if you know what I mean. You know the green recovery. You know you can't do anything without us. Uh, you know the, the, it's a very noisy, congested rim, if you like, of the financing conversation. Everybody's mainstreaming themselves around the edges. Um, and then when you've got the health COVID conversation, it's even more congested. So there's this COVID, there's this health COVID, and then you've got the edge where everybody's COVIDizing their response. So it's, it's a real battleground at the moment. And as the, as the window of COVID financing closes, um, it's going to get more and more bloody, I feel. I mean, uh, we've had partial conversations about, about the tactics of all of this, uh, which is why I was raising the, the G20 uh, health and financing board conversations. So we may need to look beyond the COVID into PPR fairly quickly um, financing and then re-strategize around how to get that narrative straight, which is why it's interesting you mentioned influenza, which is the dominant um, PPR threat, which hasn't gone away and won't go away for the, for the foreseeable. Tom, thank you very much. Always useful. Um, we always look forward to your uh, you know, thoughts um, uh, and writings. Now, Swinging across to um, West Africa, Joshua Makubu um, is the minister of the OT region, the Ghana Society of the Physically Disabled and the Ghana NCD Alliance, many hats. 
being warned, Joshua. Um, but you've got lived experience. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're in the a political situation out there. We're talking up in, in the, you know, Washington and New York and Geneva. What is going on on the ground? Please explain from the real world perspective. Um, what is the financial situation there and the politics of all of this? Welcome, Joshua. Thank you very much, Douglas. Um, I think I want to start from uh, your comment where you say the problem now is how to pursue the financing structures. And if we wait and the COVID funding window closes, we, we are actually going to get into a very messy situation. Um, I was looking at it this way. Why are we talking about COVID funding, COVID funding, COVID funding? And for us in the NCD business, we are not able to actually segregate and let the effect of COVID on persons living with N NCDs actually stand out. Uh, if you come to Ghana uh, from the perspective of production and development, uh, persons with NCDs have lost jobs during this period. The treatment has, um, recently raising and people have to spend three times what they used to spend to go for treatment, access to treatment centers as the hospitals were flooded and then there were no even vacancies. There are some places you cannot go. So before you even go to the drugstore, a pharmacy to get a drug, uh, the cost had tripled. So it's actually counterproductive and counter development. Now for us as NCD Alliance in this country, what we tried to do from the beginning was to impress upon the president of the country to um, unpack that kind of, um, he was making a statement and those who were dying, those who were most affected, then there was a blanket statement underlining conditions. What were these underlining conditions? We struggled and then we petitioned the office of the president and listening as he has always been, that was unpacked and the NCDs actually stood. So the situation was not different from what was happening in other countries. But why is it that moving from um, the impact of COVID-19 to look at funding for COVID-19, we still go the blanket way. Um, what is currently happening in Ghana as far as the COVID pandemic um, um, and health delivery in Ghana is concerned is Ghana has uh, moved a step ahead to beef up health infrastructure, to be able to take care of any of such pandemic. And today we have something we call the COVID-19 levy in, in, in our budgeting system that taxes are being collected. But the question is, as you indicated, for us as persons living with NCDs, the advocates in that sector, were we able to actually convince the, the presidency, the government of the day, the finance minister, to ensure that whatever levies we were getting from uh, this taxation, we should make sure that at least in as much as we consider the general impact and recovery from the COVID um, attack, a portion of that particular levy should be set aside to finance people who live with what NCDs and they will continue to seek treatment. 111 hospitals are being built across all the districts and regions in the country as a response to the COVID um, uh, situation. Have we struggled to be able to get to a level where we are able to make sure that at least uh, centers for early detection and then treatment of what? Um, COVID cases are part of these hospitals. As I speak to you now, and as I spoke with Labram, it's not something that we have not gotten a definite answer to it. So when it comes to funding, actually the situation in Ghana is counterproductive and it's counter development because most of our people have lost their jobs. They have to pay extra. And now that even the COVID pandemic has even shrink the employment basket, uh, the situation has actually uh, worsened. But I feel that, thank God, we have the National Health Insurance Scheme that we have been speaking to government about. We'll continue to push to ensure that at least Funding is made to cater for the treatment of NCDs. And then we have also succeeded in getting some people to listen to us now. And we are not thinking about this syntax 
where tobacco product and that other unhealthy diet are going to have attract some penalties that will bring in some revenue. But as to whether those revenue will be channeled into funding the treatment and the detection of what NCD situation is what we are still looking at. But I think so far so good. Uh, the government is getting to understand and not until we are able to unpack the disease burden and let NCD stand alone and we trumpet the effect and why there's the need for funding. That is the only way the financial structures will be persuaded and then we will have people listening to us. But if we continue to talk about NCDs, NCD, and we need funding without getting the people to really appreciate and see the need and get convinced, then it's going to be very difficult. And I think the COVID pandemic is something that we should take advantage because all over the world, which bracket of the population was affected most? People with underlining conditions. What were those underlining conditions? The NCDs. So let's go ahead and use the COVID as a, a case study to make our case and call we are the most vulnerable. So whatever is done in respect of COVID, we should be properly taken care of. More investment should come in our direction and more funding should be channeled into uh, NCD related uh, treatment and other things. If we don't take advantage, then I think the situation will become worse when COVID is forgotten. Thank you, Joshua. Good luck to you, that's for sure. Um, there's no doubt that uh, social protection is higher on the agenda with its links to health financing. Um, and there's no doubt that health taxes are higher on the agenda than they were. Uh, that doesn't mean the, uh, uh, the uh, obstacles are disappeared, but they are certainly um, being scrutinized much more than they were. And I'm seeing certainly in, uh, in my organization, UNDP, much more openness to looking at health-related uh, taxation mechanisms as a viable you know, overall strategy than, than pre-COVID. I mean, we're, our conversations are much more fruitful than they have been in the uh, tobacco, uh, sugar and alcohol arenas. Thank you, Joshua. Fantastic. You keep going. Um, we're going to go on to our second panel now, because I'm the terrible chair and talk way too much, um, losing time. Catalyzing investment opportunities to support greater integration of NCDs across global health goals, programs and mechanisms. Uh, we're going to jump to the World Bank. Uh, Andrea Saita. Lead private sector World Bank. Um, the bank, of course, is who we look to um, for innovating, moving mountains, uh, trying out new things, getting things going. Um, you've done great things in SDG financing, UHC financing. Um, where do we go on in CD financing, Andreas? Please welcome. Thank you, Doug. Um, yeah, and uh, very happy to be here on this. Uh, panel and, and uh, also very happy to be in a meeting that is organized by uh, NCD Alliance, by civil society, by an organization that represents the people living with NCDs, because I think they need to play an important role in you know, advocating within their countries and at global level, as you're doing, but I think we, we can do jointly, we can do more of that. So World Bank is a major financer for um, health system strengthening. Um, that's, I don't need to explain that. Um, we, our way of financing is, um, the, you know, the bulk of financing is through loans that we give to governments and then the government implements it. It goes to the budget and it's being spent under the government's control, um, their Ministry of Finance, their Ministry of Health um, as part of their budget. And then over the years repaid um, to the World Bank. And in the case of uh, low-income countries, it's a highly subsidized uh, mechanism, which is called um, AIDA. Um, but the, the decision on what to finance at the end of the day is, of course, with the government. And the government decides where the priorities are when you have uh, an underfinanced health system and you have many um, you know, competing um, areas where you want to invest, you still have high maternal mortality, infectious diseases, and so on. And in the past, often um, the NCDs have been, been kind of past the point where you have to cut off because of, uh, you know, the, the limit that you can um, manage in terms of financial burden, but also in terms of the, uh, the workload capacity that the implementers have. Uh, part of that is also because we, like Ben mentioned, and like all the other organizations that depend on uh, 
you know, um, the, the big part of uh, ODA that is available worldwide. We are, of course, influenced um, also by the uh, priorities of the major donor countries, which in the past were not on NCD. So when we're looking, um, Ben mentioned trust funds. Trust fund is an instrument that the World Bank is using and in health more than in any other practice. Um, we are using trust fund to basically provide the technical assistance that helps the countries decide what is a good investment. And of course, there is a certain bias if you have 100 times as much money for uh, maternal and child health and for infectious diseases than you have for NCDs. It is very clear where, um, we, can, where we can afford to provide technical assistance. No? So um, I have to say that um, luckily, since about you know, three, four years ago, we are part of a partnership, uh, Access Accelerated. Um, uh, NCD Alliance is another partner here where we have funding from the private sector, from a consortium of uh, companies. That is it's kind of the first time that we actually have dedicated NCD funding in a trust fund for supporting NCDs. And the demand was great. So there was a, even during the pandemic now when all our teams were out there and you know focusing on, on the immediate COVID response, we still had several teams coming back and uh, with proposals for funding of NCD advisory work. And that is what basically then triggers investments in NCDs when we can help the countries develop their strategy, do the economic analysis, define what in their context are the best buys, what fits best into their system, what they can implement with the uh, resources they have. So, I mean, it's, it's a sign that there is um, demand that can be triggered when we are facilitating um, the decision-making at the government side. And coming back to what I said initially, the role of civil society is important. We have uh, seen in some countries, such as Kenya, Ghana, for example, um, very good synergies between the uh, on-the-ground activities of the NCD Alliance and our work with the government. Um, there are many other countries where this is not yet the case. So I'm advocating also internally, we have now um, about close to 30 countries where we are working in a um, analytical advisory fashion to help governments define what they can do um, to address NCDs. And in all these countries, um, I'm, I'm trying to get our local um, team leaders to actually collaborate with local um, you know, civil society and, and uh, people living with NCDs uh, so that we are you know, coming from a, from a concerted and that we also get into the, the space that is the most cost-effective one, which is the the, you know, what you can do to prevent NCDs before they enter the health system, huh? because our current work is focused on the health system itself, where, of course, once you have someone who is sick, you need to provide them treatment, you need to provide them um, efficient, uh, low-cost, uh, you know, chronic care medicines, for example. But um, if you go broader, if you look at uh, areas, nutrition, agriculture, um, general you know, city planning and everything, there's many more things that can be done and that can be better influenced locally when you have an organization that is systematically looking into that. Let me stop here. I'm happy to um, contribute to the discussion, answer questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, it's, it's totally clear that there is a, um, an overwhelming demand from, from countries for this idea of, of uh, trade-off analysis, you know, where to invest first, uh, to where to make the investments in the, in the spectrum of prevention, secondary prevention, treatment, and the work with civil society as agents in that is absolutely uh, crucial. Uh, and as, I've, uh, as I, I think I hinted earlier on that uh, a lot of the resources coming through the ODAH channels is actually going to, to civil society, more so than there has been the case for infectious diseases, proportionately more. So the, the, the wealth of experience in civil society in this space has already been uh, demonstrated. Um, and I think it's up to us as the, as the multilateral community to ensure that we're all um, talking to each other to make sure that our support to member states is... Um, is, uh, is, is coherent in this respect as, as member state demand um, is, is on the rise in this respect. So great stuff. I think the, there's, there's a lot of work for us all to do. Thanks, Andreas. Um, I'm gonna rush across to um, uh, Fiona Olivier. 
who's the head of communications and public affairs at General Medicines at Sanofi. Um, and then there's this huge question of the role of the private sector as a stakeholder in this, this large question of, of financing, engagement, uh, agency, and the where do we, well, how does the private sector fit into this with this question of sustainable capacity building, uh, building of demand, um, you know, in the medium to long term? Uh, Fiona, you're very welcome. Thank you, Douglas, and uh, thanks very much to the organisers for, for the opportunity to participate in this uh, really great discussion. Um, I would say, uh, to answer your question, Douglas, that the private sector certainly does have a role to play and is willing to, pay, to play that role, and I think we've seen that in the, in the last uh, 18 months with the COVID situation. Um, I would like to say maybe three things. Um, the first is, it's time, and I think we've heard this through with the other speakers, it's time to challenge the status quo. It's time for action. The second thing is indeed that the private sector can play a role. And the third one, which is the subject of our, our panel here, is that new models are needed and a different form of incentives are needed. So let me come back and talk a little bit about um, the first point. The burden is not new and it's time for action. I saw a study there recently from a Professor Bloom in Harvard which is that um, the cost of inaction is $47, tri $47 trillion between 2010 and 2025. By the time we finish talking here today in the two hours that we've been talking, um, 7,000 people will have died from an NCD. So the time is now, but what we need to be able to um, bring in all of uh, government and uh, all of society um, model together is some policy legislation and regulatory uh, work to allow some of that to happen. Coming on to the role of the private sector, um, I think there's a number of different areas where the private sector can play. A, one, one is clearly in terms of the expertise that it can bring to the table, and I'll talk about that. But I also think there are a few so, some quick wins that uh, we should be looking at. Um, much of the private sector invests in pension funds, um, and, and pension funds themselves invest, and Bente talked about it earlier on, um, in the tobacco and alcohol industry. I think there's a quick win there where we could be asking uh, the private sector, um, and I'm not just talking about the health sector, but the larger private sector to, to um, push for um, pension funds, for example, that are aligned with ESG uh, priorities. I think uh, the private sector can also bring a lot to the table in terms of expertise. Um, one of the things that we, we look at at uh, Sanofi is the whole of the patient experience. And, you know, 80% of the variance in health outcomes we know is based on socioeconomic, but also on, on behaviors and mindsets. And I think that there's an opportunity there where different expertises can come to the table to understand that. What, what is driving certain patient behaviors? We know that just delivering medicines and vaccines alone is not going to uh, bring a patient outcome. And we've got some interesting pilots and initiatives in China. We've just signed a joint venture with an organization called JD, where we're looking at internet and health. And it looks across the entire patient journey. The, the last thing maybe uh, quickly to talk about are new models. Um, just earlier this year, Sanofi announced um, the creation of something called a global health unit. And what we've done here, I think it, 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 to the best of my knowledge, it's the first of its kind in the industry. We've created a very specific business unit in our, in our company, which is providing 30 life-saving medicines to 40 uh, lower income countries. And the idea here is it's not to make a profit. And any marginal benefit that we will make from this will be pumped back uh, into, for example, um, training healthcare professionals in some of these uh, countries. I think that you know, that's a model that's uh, certainly worth um, looking at. Um, and then finally, to finish up, I, I think there's an opportunity to look at some financial innovation, um, social impact bonds, uh, blended financing. I'm not an expert in this area, um, but I do know it's something that we are looking at as, is, uh, other, as are other um, uh, players in the, in the industry. But I think what's missing is a, is a solid business case. Um, and, you know, how do we demonstrate the return on investment in, in these areas? So I'll finish uh, there, Douglas. Really happy to, to be able to participate and looking forward to the discussion. 
Thanks, Fiona. Um, I th you, you, you mentioned the business case there. And of course, this, this concept of expanding markets in, in low and middle income countries, particularly low income countries where the disease burden is growing, um, but the market base is, is, still, is still nascent. Um, so this brings in the concept of, of, you know, of the questions around equitable pricing and access and how to get the balance right and alignment of all of the incentives that are, are floating around. And this is, you know, there's a lot of the questions that we faced back in the, the early days of HIV. So there's this question of alignment of incentives that need to be negotiated in this space as we go forward. So there's this, um, it's, it's really important that as we, as we bring in all of the, the questions around primary prevention, secondary prevention uh, and treatment and therapeutics, um, that those incentives are constantly negotiated as we go forward. So bringing in your perspective, Fiona, is absolutely critical. Thanks for coming in. Um, and it's, it's, it's complicated, but it's, it's, it's super important um, that we get this right. And every country is, is, is very, very different uh, as we know. But Fiona, thank you for that. Um, Andrea Figo. Uh, you are the CEO of the Health Finance Institute, and my light's just gone out. Celebrate that fact. <laughs> it's very dodgy light here. It does this to me. Just bang on cue. Now, we talk a lot about innovative financing. Some people are not convinced. Some people are. Um, but in this space, because we might say traditional financing is not working, um, the question might be, well, do we then rush towards novel financing or new forms of financing? We all, do we rush into you know, crypto all of a sudden and say, this is the answer? The answer <laughs> is not. But what, 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 where's the shining light in these new innovative finding, financing mechanisms, Andrea? Convince us. Um, thank you so much, uh, Doug. And, um... Um, I would love nothing more than talk about crypto right now because, um, but anyways, um, so thank you so much um, for the, um, for this opportunity and I'm really um, honored to be on this panel, um, organized by NCD Alliance and Sanofi and um, I, I will get to your question around um, where innovative finance or blended finance can work and what the Health Finance Institute as part of its core work um, is, is doing to delineate um, um, and, and create better solutions and answers to that. But um, I want to um, take a little bit of a broader focus on the first in the first couple two minutes of my five minutes, which is that um, we actually, um, um, NCD Alliance and HFI had a roundtable on October 12th in person in DC, um, talking specifically around, you know, pandemic, um, post-pandemic financing and how to link chronic disease financing with um, with with the with with that larger agenda and um, some of the key takeaways were that you know we have to report back to the ministries of finance and include ministries of finance into in these conversations because the numbers just do work out and one of the other key takeaways was basically that there is sort of a uh, pandemic preparedness and response funding is a significant opportunity and that was of course before the G20 meeting and before the COP meeting happened and as I was preparing for today's conversation I was reading some of the statements and the resolutions and and and, and uh, that came out of these um, really high level meetings and um and, and, and I really thought about um, where we are in terms of global solidarity, where we are in the middle of a pandemic that caused, um, you know, 17 million deaths, many of which are related to chronic um, conditions as well. And we're in the midst of, you know, the precipice of, of a climate crisis that will significantly alter um, the, the way we inhabit this planet. So. Um, and yet there have been um, no financial commitments. Um, there, there was an ask for 75 billion for the pandemic. And there was, was an ask for a similar amount of money um, from again, um, largely um, uh, higher income countries and really nothing, um, um, nothing has precipitated in terms of strong commitments. And so to me or to us, it's sort of that, you know, when you look at global solidarity or me first, the me first agenda is, is still prevailing. And even if we think that the conversation has changed, I think we need to realize here that the technical solutions as strong and the business cases as strong as we can make them in and of themselves will not bring about that change. So 
I think we have to reckon with this fact as a community because we all strongly believe in our human right to life and we also very strongly believe in that connection between health and wealth. And we've shown that time and again with that $47 trillion paper that we published in 2011 with the statistics that Dr. Bente has shown and so on. But these things are not enough. So I think as a community, we have to ask ourselves, how do we help change um, you know, the zeitgeist of me first versus actually a more global solidarity focused um, um, approach? And how do we perhaps not just hold leaders accountable and not just ask the questions of how do we get those, um, you know, um, pandemic preparedness plans or building back better plans reference entities, but how do we actually help change leadership to reflect the very values that we represent as a community? Now, back to um, what what we're doing at HFI um, and, and, and how we are basically um, trying to be part of that solution. So um, we are focused um, on, on two things and really our theory of changes is that better evidence and better business cases and, and figuring and, and determining where um, public and private sector can work together in blended finance um, uh, 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 can bring about better investments in health. So we have a very, uh, so we have an NCD, uh, an economics unit, and we have an innovative finance unit and an, and an overall advocacy um, arm that basically helps us um, um, bring about um, these um, uh, business cases and, 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 and communicate them. So one of our seminal work that will come out is basically uh, uh, being on a partnership with Washington University where we looked at um, a sea of different um, donor finance, technical assistance, domestic finance, and blended finance projects to say, where can blended, where has blended finance worked? So where can finance and a collaboration between public and private sector work? And where, um, um, you know, where do we need more public um, responses, national responses, and where do we need TA responses? And the key takeaways are, is that when it comes to commodities and, and access and adherence programs, that is where um, public-private financing, um, blended finance, um, and pay-for-success models could work the best when it comes to lower-income countries. And when it comes to higher-income countries, we have seen successes um, when it comes to healthcare policies. And you know, when there's a strong existing payer, like a, health, a universal health insurance, then you can actually superimpose pay-for-success models like social and development impact bonds. But at the same time, for things like technical assistance, for, for basic um, yeah, uh, in infrastructure in terms of uh, in healthcare workers uh, uh, training and things like that, you still need a strong public response. And especially for the for most vulnerable populations, you still need um, technical uh, uh, development assistance for health as well. Um, I uh, Last but not least, I know I'm at time, I, um, my team will be posting a, um, a video um, link that we created about um, how HFI basically views, uh, answers, and, and tackles um, with these questions around, you know, what financing is needed where, and what does it mean um, when, we, when the uh, WHO and UN has called for 20% of the financing response to chronic diseases should um, should come potentially from, from private sector funding as well. Mm. I thank you, Andrea. That, the, I think this question of um, what, is a pro, what is blended financing and what is appropriate for the private component of blended financing, I think is a really interesting question um, because we, we, we assume in the heterogene uh, sort of homogeneity of what is appropriate, and we haven't gone into that that, that question. Um, and we get sort of bamboozled a little bit with um, the idea of, oh, impact financing is the way forward and everything therefore could be impact financed. But of course, that's not the case. And we're still very immature, I feel, about trying to understand the supply demand mechanisms in, in that area. It's more advanced in, in, in some development spaces, green bonds, I think, are leading the way, perhaps. Um, but in the health space, I think they're, they're, there's a lot of work to do. So I think we are relying on your on your insights and experimentations and learnings in that. I think it's very, the NCD arena must uh, pick that up very, very quickly. 
Okay, we've got um, how much time? Not much time, 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, I, I'm going to throw a question out to all of you, if you, if I can, if you're all there. Um, I'm concocting a question. Joanna Ralston um, prodded a question in my mind, so I'm going to sort of try and formulate. Um, there's a there's a there's a, a there's a diametrically opposed framing uh, which we've got in front of us at the moment. I mean, we could say that um, traditionally there's been no money for NCDs because um, we've had this idea that. Um, you know, we've been using this libertarian frame. Of, we've been talking about individual behavior and individual responsibility, and you know, the, the, the money hasn't flowed because individuals are responsible for their own bad health, essentially. And governments have then said, "Well, that's not our responsibility." And then, you know, this this sort of this this perpetual problem of individual uh, blaming, um, which has then and governments have stepped back from the the financing of this. Um, which has been a perpetual framing problem. I think we've all we've all suffered from. Now, I mean, Tom, to 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 your point, if we then step back and look at this from a global health security perspective, and then we take the logic that, well, you know, if we look at susceptibility and vulnerability, and then we follow the who should pay as a response from a global health security, and say, well, NCDs, underlying conditions, pathogens, Zika, influenza, COVID, you name it then the whole world is looking at this from a global health security perspective. And then the payment suddenly is in this 15 billion, $75 billion conversation around pandemic preparedness and response. And all of a sudden it's not about individuals putting the wrong things in their own bodies because they can't resist you know, advertisers and making bad choices. This is a polar opposite framing. So, you know, do we need to then shift this framing to actually shift the mindset completely of the way that NCDs are viewed from a uh, from a financing perspective, um, you know, to, to to lead on what on what what Tom was saying, and actually pursue this wholeheartedly, and 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 reject for once and for all this this notion of individualized responsibility, and look more at the global health security agenda from a structural perspective. Who's going to take that on and simplify what I just said? <laughs> I'm, Andrew, I'm, is that I'm, a finger? I'm, I Go also like, I, I, I'm going to start. Hopefully, others can build off of that. I mean, I think that I, I think that 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 framing is 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 needs to be. We need a reframing for either like the the social determinants or or others, right? And it's it's harder when we talk about chronic diseases because you know we don't. There, it's not a vector borne disease, but but it is a transnational threat when we look at, um, um, you know, what foods are being consumed to what, what kind of air we breathe, right? So I think we, we have to really push, you know, recognize the importance of prevention and, and the right policy frameworks, but really um, emphasize, emphasize the, the social determinant component there in, in the framing and, um, and, and, and then the, you know, if, if you look at, um, if you look at, for example, like, you know, who gets vaccinated and which countries have higher vaccination uptakes, um, you know, sort of anything between what they call um, libertarian paternalism in a book nudge to actually like strong incentives and nudges, these, these types of policies work better than just recommendations. And I think we need to take these types of learnings and framings into account. Um, be, because you know, because the disease burden is not just us individually making decisions. We we live in a society and we live in context of of, of social determinants. Over. Anybody else want to add to that, Bante? You look like you're on the way to the airport. Is that right? Or... No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm 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 on my way to IARC. So um, discussing cancer. So, um, you know, I, I want to, I, I don't want to answer a question fully because I think we need to be very pragmatic now. Uh, so, sort of, you know, I, I want to say enough talking now. Let's, let's act now. I mean, we see a lot of money flowing for, uh, for COVID and for uh, building back better. 
a lot of institutions. Actually, the whole uh, global architecture is changing as we are driving towards Lyon. So uh, I think we need to really work hard to help uh, countries at the country level to define demands. So we don't hear anymore the global firm saying, as they told us when we tried to lobby for the new strategy, we cannot see any demands coming from NCD. We hear you, it's logic, but where is the demand? And then we heard you and FPA actually were able to give a demand for cervical cancer and increase the access from the Global Fund with 14 million just by being very cleverly doing what was needed at country level. So that's one thing. The second is, why don't we build on what we have done for several years? So we had a working group uh, under the uh, Global Coordination Mechanism on Financing. Uh, not so many people maybe have looked into the annexes. There are two beautiful annexes. One is actually a stepwise approach to funding at country level. Taking into account what kind of funding structure is already there, both given from international and, and also uh, domestic. It is the second index is about typologies, because when I uh, worked in, in uh, Euro, all the stand countries actually have the same structure, the same funding structure as well. So it's easier to go in by a stepwise approach, call it whatever, to support them to actually build on their current structure and change um, towards their uh, epidemiology. Then we had uh, the first financing conference in Denmark in 2018. And we have planned a second one now in 2022-23 from WHO with partners. I think that's also a good one. But we, while we are discussing, we actually need to act. And as I said, I think what is needed is more granularity, more specificity, more sort of a real answer to the demand felt by the population and also felt by the Minister of Health and Minister of Development in countries. So a short uh, answer to all of this is we need to strengthen the capacity on the ground to help them to really write the good proposals, uh, do the stepwise approach, and also to use different fun financial elements and to include the best buys. Of course, we do taxation for health, but it is not uh, a secret that by doing this efficiently, we are also able to support the health budget at the best. So that was what was I wanted to say. Maybe I didn't answer the question, but I think Tom did a fantastic, much more granular um, argumentation why we need to invest in, uh, in uh, uh, NCDs while uh, building up from, from COVID. I think we have enough data for that as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Benji. Giving an answer is always more important than giving the answer in my book. Um, so, Articulating the demand, and I think looking at the, the you know overperformers, if you like, of a country level about expanding domestic fiscal space. I mean, how are they done it? What drives that? Um, Tom, your hand. I, I just wanted to add one thing. I mean, I, I have yet to find the policymaker who uh, says they don't follow the evidence in mm -hmm. what they invest in. Whether they practice what they preach is a, a different matter. We're in a scenario where. Um, you know, in terms of many of the proposals right now of how we respond to the pandemic are talking about investing in the same things that have demonstrably not changed rates of infections or deaths in this pandemic. And I can't imagine anyone arguing in any other circumstance that we should double down and pay even more money for the things that haven't succeeded for the next time. That said, on the NCD space, we need to also practice what we preach. We should be aggressive, in my view, about pointing out what the evidence is, but we should also be evidence-based. Unlike a lot of the other areas of global health, we need to emphasize what aspects of NCDs has made a difference in this pandemic and then tie the interventions we want funded to those. Instead of recycling, which I think a lot of other uh, civil society groups in global health are doing, recycling the very same proposals we had prior to the pandemic, saying we should fund all of those now after the pandemic. We should be very targeted about which NCDs in particular have made a difference where and what are the evidence-based interventions that would make uh, a difference for addressing them and then tie those to global health security. 
And in my view, that would allow a strong evidence base, but also to distinguish what I think every other global health community uh, sub-community is doing in terms of recycling the same things they're asking for before, but saying COVID has demonstrated that we need to fund those things now. That, that would be my advice. The, uh, we'll go from the best buys to the best best buys. That will be an uh, 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 important but um, difficult conversation to have, but I agree. We need to be more and more specific all the time about what is most cost effective. I think that's what these investment cases at national level are all about. Uh, thank you, Tom. Andreas. Yeah, yeah so I um, uh, just wanted to find out also, we are doing a little bit work also um, at the global level um, with uh, focus on you know, heads of state and ministers of finance and um, demonstrating the, the economic costs of not um, investing in NCDs. And uh, uh, from coming from that angle to the value and the kind of the you know your the gain you have if you invest and where you should invest i'm not sure tom that we should be driven only by the um the numbers that we get from the um, pandemic um you know survival rates i mean there are other factors that might not have shown during the pandemic i'm thinking for example the discussion on mental health and how it impacts um, societies and um, what we can do about it and what we cannot do, I think, is an important one that may not show um, a direct correlation to, um, you know, death rates under COVID. But um, definitely, I mean, it's good to have a, you know, take a fresh look at um, the proposals. I find the, the countries are very willing. So the, the original question, Doug, that you posed, um, yeah, okay. Um, it's not a question that prevents us from acting. We have enough demand. Yeah? So it's really more do we have enough capacity. We are investing internally in capacity. We are having a, we're growing our team that can advise on NCDs. And so we are hoping that there's more resources also than for um, this technical advisory work that is needed. And um, as Bente pointed out earlier, we are actually working closely with her team now at WHO to see that we are also putting the, the strength of the different organizations together and in parallel and trying to help governments to um, you know, make, the right, make the right decision, make the right choices, and then we can go and we can invest. Thank you, Andreas. In, in our experience of doing investment cases, when you talk to the ministers of finance, they, they don't like to be told the, the amount of costs and losses that their policies are perpetuating on an annual basis. They don't like it, especially when you talk to the press at the same time. Um, Anders, last word to your good self. No, thank you. Just adding a comment um, a bit different from what, um, what I've heard here uh, in order to be able to move this forward. I still think we have homework to do just to inform the work in terms of the burden of disease. 15 million people dying prematurely just the magnitude of this. People haven't got that yet. And also that this is, a, this is something that is mainly affecting poor people. This is a poverty issue. I mean, people have, are not getting that, especially not in the development community. So just the figures, first thing. Second is in terms of where to invest and how to invest and how to get the money. Um, those are political decisions and also to be able to show that some of those long-term investments are not just cost, but you will get positive impact that can generate positive political benefits. Um, I mean, you had the whole work on, on smoking, which I think is the easy and good example of that. Smoke-free smoke, smoke -free environments today is something that people appreciate. So politicians can do something which is actually something that they got positive feedback from their voters. Uh, smoking, food, good food, healthy food, tasty food, uh, the positive tra trajectory here around changes that are needed to be able to sort of reduce the risks. Uh, because to get politicians to force them into something that will pay off 25 years later, that is just painful for people, difficult. But if you can rather position that as something that is actually positive, so the politicians can deliver something for the voters, uh, that is something that people will appreciate. So I think also some of this, how you create an environment in society that is actually more attractive for people, which you can very easily, but it's a matter of how we communicate and how we package some of the things that needs to be done. Thank you.
Thank you, Anders. Uh, no question that um, health security is now a political issue. Health um, performance on COVID responses is a political issue in the United States. So the question is, what is the politicization of NCDs? If we want to get political capital attention in this, when we're doing return on investment, it's a return on political investment as well as economic investment. Maybe that's the message, Anders, you are giving us there. It's not just uh, money, it's political capital that we should be uh, looking at as well. Panelists, thank you very much. Um, we could talk all day on this. Uh, we have to go on to other things. Katie Dane, um, you are the CEO of the NCD Alliance. Um, please summarize everything that's just been said in two minutes and uh, <laughs> lead us on our merry way. Katie, good to see you. Thanks very much, Doug, and thanks to all of our speakers for, for a really rich and, and broad discussion on NCD financing in the context of, of COVID-19. Um, yes, I have the unenviable task to try and summarise and, and wrap this all up. Um, I think firstly, um, to me, when I was listening to the conversations, two key messages came out very loud and clear in terms of NCDs in COVID and that and how that relates to financing. And the first one was that the legacy of underinvestment in NCDs has made COVID worse. So this should be a wake up call for governments and political leaders to really value, prioritise and invest in health NC and NCDs. And secondly, that the deadly, co uh, the deadly coalition of NCDs in COVID have reinforced the need for integrated responses and the need to break down silos in global health. Obviously, the vast majority of, of our panelists' conversations have really been drilling down into the how. Um, what are the strategies and the opportunities to make NCD financing less repellent, in Doug Webb's words, from the, from the very beginning? Um, and I think to, to group a few of the, the comments that have been made, I think there was one um, grouping around how we're framing the issue. And I think I, I really want to echo what Anders was saying near the end there in terms of the fact that we've got a lot still to do in terms of making the case on the magnitude of the burden and, and that this is a poverty issue, particularly to development agencies and to the whole development sector. I think even though 2015 was a turning point in getting NCDs into the SDGs, we've still got a long way to go in terms of making that, that case. Um, and also to pick up on Johanna's uh, point in the, the chat about the fact that the challenge of NCD still being seen as a, a lifestyle choice and that perhaps inadvertently contributing to a lower prioritisation amongst donors and, and policymakers alike that, that assumes that this is about blame um, and this is about, um, you know, we need to be focusing on ind individual behaviour change rather than the broader systemic and environmental um, context that people are living in. Um, I also really want to build on the point that um, Tom made near the end there about not being lazy and not just recycling the same old asks that we've always had and really trying to be granular and tie and frame NCDs as a security, resilience, equity and stability issue, um, which I think is so important in, in the context of the pandemic and COVID. I think the second kind of grouping for me was around kind of data and the investment case. Um, that um, going to Doug's point, it, there's, it's a noisy battleground and how do we really cut through? Um, and I think one of the kind of common threads through the conversation has been this challenge of lack of data on NCD financing. You know, if you look at the, the actual, you know, amount of data that we have on development assistance for health, on domestic expenditure, as well as the fact that in NCDs, we still actually don't have a very clear global target for NCD financing, like so many other health issues have. So I think looking towards the high level meeting in 2025, that you know, needs to be one of our kind of focuses for, for all of this, but also in terms of investment cases at the country level. And I think you know, the point has been made that you know, ministers of finance, finance don't necessarily want problems, but they want solutions and they want country context specific data on the investment case in the short term, but going to Anders's point, the longer term um, game as well. And I think that's where the real challenge is, how we continue to make the case for the long-term investment of NCDs when so many um, uh, politicians are looking at the short-term political cycle that they work in. So in order to get around that, I think our investment cases need to include the short-term gains as well as the long-term um, and to be going to Bente's point, be as granular and specific as possible. And whilst we all continue to talk about NCDs, let's get down into the nitty gritty details of disease specific and risk factor data around the investment case. 
And then I think we've covered a lot around um, some of the financing approaches and opportunities and a, and a common thread again I heard was this opportunity around um, integrating NCDs into what's already there in terms of global health financing and programs. And I think Andrea made the point in the, in the chat about the fact that demand often is responsive to available vehicles and financing platforms. We've never had a global fund for, for NCDs and we've never really asked for it specifically, but what we do have now is a multi-partner trust fund. And now that we've got that mechanism, that there is that obvious kind of you know, financing platform to be driving support to, to countries through. Um, I think Anders's point at the beginning there about a reminder that ODA and development assistance for health is not the only answer, um, that we absolutely need to focus on domestic resource mobilization as well. And that um, the momentum around unhealthy commodity tax is, is exciting and an opportunity to build off tobacco taxation into alcohol and SSB tax, as well as li linking these things into UHC and social protection mechanisms. And we've obviously heard a lot about the, the role of the private sector and the need for solid business cases, getting alignment of incentives right. And the fact that, as Andrea made the point, you know, recognizing that public private partnerships and approaches are not necessarily appropriate for everything that we're doing in terms of NCDs, but perhaps certain areas around, for example, commodities um, being, being one area. And the important point that Fiona made, I think, around you know, the private sector's role is not just as potentially a, as an investor, but also as a divester from unhealthy commodity industries like tobacco and alcohol um, and, and junk food. I, I think the other common thread that I heard was this kind of, um, and perhaps I'm a little bit biased in saying this, but the role of civil society in all of this and the fact that we, we play a critical role in, in building the demand, in ensuring that we have people living with NCDs at the front and centre of, of what we're doing, and that governments are really hearing that voice and that there is that clear demand for additional financing and um, more efficient financing in NCDs as well. Um, and Bente's point near the end there about the opportunities of a WHO Global NCD Financing Conference in 22 to 23, date still to be confirmed, but as an important milestone towards the high level meeting in 2025 for all of our advocacy efforts. Um, and finally, just to pick up on Anders's point at the beginning there, you know, it, it takes hard work building on what we've seen um, with, in Glasgow with the COP. Um, this week and next, and it doesn't change overnight. And we absolutely have to play the long game in terms of um, financing for NCDs. So with that, I would really like to thank um, Doug uh, as our moderator um, for this event. I would like to thank our co-host um, Sanofi and the Health Finance Institute for, for joining us um, in this endeavor. And I'd also like to thank um, all of our speakers and, and keynote speaker Anders for, for joining us. Um, and particularly thank all of our audience for, for staying with us, recognizing that we've gone uh, a little bit over. Um, this event has been recorded so everyone can dial, can watch it back um, when you have an opportunity as well if you've missed it. But thank you all and um, have a good rest of your week. Thank you, goodbye.